housekeeping out of the way. All right. And recording. Uh, then we'll get to the meat of it. Woo. So, all right. Um, welcome, everybody. Appreciate you tuning in on a Monday night for our typical monthly meetings. Uh, we are just sharing with Josh and Scott that we've had all of these on our website going back three and a half years. So if you want some entertainment, go check out that very first one we ever recorded uh, and did because we couldn't do it live and in person. I think we were probably, see, we were probably still CPIG even for that one. Oh, yeah. We I were imagine. CPIG, yeah. yeah. Columbus yeah. Passive Interest so, Group or yeah, Columbus uh, Passive investment, Investing Group. Investing, investing, yeah. yeah right. Investors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so a couple of housekeeping items real quick, uh, mostly just to call out on our calendar. We've got a, actually a very busy week. Very happy to have the group of Accountable Equity on tonight to share some information about the State of the Union with them and so forth. We've got um, Lunch and Learn tomorrow and a Boston local meetup and our Next Generation uh, Investor meetup tomorrow night as well. Then we've got a couple more Open Tribe deal webinars on Wednesday and Thursday. And then our fellows from Accountable Equity will be back on Friday to present the uh, EI, latest EIF fund that uh, to the community and so forth. So we appreciate you coming back on for that on Friday as well at noon Eastern. Um, and we'll also have, uh, or no, I'm sorry, our mound visit is canceled for Friday because it was going to overlay with these gentlemen and we don't want to steal any thunder from their wonderful fund that they're going to share with us on Friday. So, uh, but with that, that's all the housekeeping I'm going to cover tonight. Um, so we've got um, Joshua Callen here from Accountable Equity. Hopefully, if you haven't heard him on Capital Hacking Podcast, please go out and check that out. It's a solid podcast. Uh, subscribe and like to it. He is an award-winning hospitality leader. He is parents of ch or parent of ch 10 children, which is an accomplishment to itself. It but mostly, he's got his roots tied to the Midwest and the great state of Ohio with his Steubenville I connections I do. and an MBA from a directional Michigan school, which we won't hold that against him. But thank you for you coming call it on directional. Yeah, I call them directional Michigan schools. We don't give them too much credit. but <laughs> I'll have to explain that to the listeners. Yes. Uh, and Scott, sorry, I didn't dig into your LinkedIn enough to be able to give you a nice round up. But Scott, thank Can you I very much for coming as well. Josh can introduce you. But guys, I am going to introduce Scott. Yeah, thank you for coming on. We appreciate the continuous support. Honestly, thank you very much from the heart. You guys have been a big help for us from the early days when we were about CPIG. Uh, we really appreciate all that you've done for Left Field through the years and everything. We love having you on. Always entertaining, always great information. Love the deals that you provide too. So thank you for coming on again that tonight. That means a lot. Mm -hmm. That means a lot to us. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. Are you going to be here to ask the tough questions? As it gets to Q&A, Steve. I, I will be here, Josh, just for you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I so want to Scott, see what's You know what's great, Steve, is uh, Scott Bendis has two uh, places in my heart. One, he was the first investor in Accountable Equity, which he's going to go over what Accountable Equity is now, its size, its scale. It's such a blessing. And two, he became the first managing director of Accountable Equity, uh, and it's a testament to what he did. So he's a, a an accredited investor. Obviously, he was a very successful person in the tech, you know, software as a service type business. Um, he ended up retiring recently and joining us full time. But before then, he did something that many of us could do right now. And I want to throw this out as a commercial, Scott. Scott approached us. He put his money in, sizable investment. He knew that his best skills we're not to go out and build buildings, but to be involved in real estate on the operational team side. So he put sweat equity in for years as my number two guy, but we weren't able to pay back then and have a real staff put together yet as we got started. So look what he did. He, he helped me in so many ways, build out the infrastructure, a lot of the technology that we're now very good at, he built. Uh, for us and has a direct relationship with all our investors. And because of that, it eventually became, he was able to retire from his day job, join us as a GP. What a testament to people who are sitting out there right now and want to know how do you really transform your career? If you're not going to be the house flipper yourself, there are other ways. And, and Scott's a blessing to us. I'm going to let Scott speak later, unless he has to say something now. He He's allowed to say whatever he wants, whenever he wants. No, I'm, I'm good. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to jump into a fun slideshow. 
And for those of us, let me see here. I'm going to try a few things, Chad, with the uh, the images of us and you. Can you see us on the screen as the yes. panel? Yes. Am I making it bigger by stretching it? Uh, no, it's in presentation mode, so it's all so it, it's all good. Tell. It's popping up. Yeah, uh, right. I think the stretching is local to our computer. Uh, okay. So, so yeah. But thanks for the it's heads coming up. through good. Yep. It's coming thanks through. for the heads up. I always say for those who are watching now on a computer. If you're using your iPhone, this is an impossible trick. But if you're on a computer, let's get linked in together. It makes it worth every visit to a webinar for you and for me. Uh, go ahead and link in so that we can stay connected. And I'll do that again in a minute. Um, boy, my little slide is not working the right way. Here it is. Okay. Uh, for me, Left Field Investors is, is a great concept that what you guys have built because I'm a big believer in the philosopher Jim Rohn. And that we really do become the average of the people we want to and choose to spend time with. As a matter of fact, I always have this slide whenever I do a left field investor slide. And I had to d shuffle the deck here today because I couldn't fit it. I wanted to put the world famous Steve Sue's pod, uh, post from nine hours ago where he said the same thing I say at the beginning of all my talks. So thank you, Steve, for teeing me up that you used Jim Rohn in your uh, comment below. And I think this is what you guys are doing on a big scale is you're, you're creating the community that allows access uh, to private deals. That's a lot of what I see in you guys. That's why I'm a big fan. And, oh, is that is that a first edition book by Dr. Steve Sue? Yep, sure is. Is that a signed copy? Yep, you can tell by the chicken scratch. It's real, which means when I put it on eBay someday, it'll get top dollar. A yep, lot it of looks fakes. like a doctor signature, right? right a there. lot of fakes out there. A lot of fake doctor signatures. That's the real one, right, Dr. Sue? Um, man, I had a good time with you guys. Columbus was gorgeous. Um, so many pictures, I can't even show them all. We had a great time. And um, what I like is a lot of people got to see the posts, which I thought was great because we want to get the word out about left field. Um, that's a picture of what we look like when there's 10 of us in the room, plus two adults is 12. Um, and we believe in community all the way to the bank, all the way to the house. Uh, this is the community we've been in building. I imagine Steve was at one of these Learn and Grow events. Maybe you're sitting behind the camera over here. Uh, Steve, what is your lovely wife's name? I forget right now. Daphne. Daphne. Yes. Daphne, I would like Daphne to come back to a Learn and Grow, Steve, with you. Oh, but absolutely. mostly because of her joy and her <laughs> gift of smiles and, and passion and She's like a gift. And that's what we've all been doing together with this community. Scott and I are building with a group of us, um, lots of in-person meetings. So we get to know each other. Um, and we think just like you guys are doing with accountable, like accountable left field investor, accountable equity was in the game that you guys are in also at the same time where we thought if you put community in a room, um, we're bringing private deals, but so are other people in our room. That's the dynamic nature of what Accountable Equity is trying to build. And so these are some pictures of some of the past events. Um, that's who we are. We have a little bit of a background in both real estate, um, you know, a nice background, I should say, in both real estate and in business turnaround. So really, I hear a lot of great stories today on podcasts. I interview a lot of great people on Capital Hacking, and we all talk about let's buy some businesses. There's baby boomers coming of age. And we agree. As a matter of fact, that's kind of what our business is, is we buy businesses and we buy gigantic, beautiful pieces of real estate. And we always say to ourselves, we're building a business which has value and we're building value add real estate. We think it's a really powerful combination for most families as part of their portfolio. If you don't know this gentleman yet, I'd love for you to look him up. His name's Matt Sorensen. I put him on here because on my LinkedIn page, again, if you just click that, I know you can't, you can't do it if you're watching on your iPhone, but if you could uh, get to my LinkedIn page, you'll see him talking about the work we do. And his point in his quote was, it's not just value add real estate we're all working on. It's also business acquisition. And he called it a strategy. So uh, his point is we've, He's gotten to know us over the years and he sees that we've put a strategy in place. The other good thing about joining us on LinkedIn is you'll get to see what we do. We try to do posts. And I want to point out one thing, Steve, just like the left field guys, um, 
and Whitney Sewell's group Life Bridge. We just did a big charity golf outing for them. We also do things with the other groups of investors. We have a lot of GoBundance investors. And sometimes they put on their entire regional conferences at our properties, which I think of that as like this virtuous circle of people invest in the building. They bring high profile events and things to the buildings. And it just kind of churns this nice circle of uh, positive growth. Um, one quick comment about us is we do not buy deals all the time. As a matter of fact, MC, who's going to be the keynote at our next event, uh, also famous guy from having uh, the Cashflow Ninja podcast, he always says, and I think he's even said it on the show when he interviews us, is what he likes about investing with us is that we only offer good deals. You are not throwing projects at investors every month. Um, of course, today, I don't know if anybody's throwing projects at investors because there's not many of deals going on in the multifamily world. But um, we've been judicious. Scott will tell you how many times he's had a weekly call with me. and He finds out we've been doing a lot of work to try to get an acquisition done. And then we have to turn away because it didn't work. And we're not we're not forcing issues. But we do we do get a lot of opportunities. These are all ones we walked away from uh, in the last few years that we got pretty serious. We could have made them work. But the, the deal structure had to be right for the investor. So that being said, um, that was all my hard pitch. If that's the hard pitch of the whole meeting, if you could join us at the next Learn and Grow, you'll get to see our buddy MC. We have other special guests. And we really think of it as the ultimate accredited investor meetup slash mastermind. And very similar in the vein of left field investor, we're very much open hearted, open armed. Um, so there'll be people in the room that are investors that actually bring deals to their guests. That's fine. There'll be people who are wanting to get one or two active deals a year, plus one or two syndications a year. We see that a lot with our investors. So there'll be conversations going on like that. And really, if you're new to this, just like when I went to the learning, uh, living uh, left field investor event a few weeks ago, sometimes just being in the room helps you become more knowledgeable as an investor and you might find a friend, maybe somebody becomes your mentor or you invest as a partner. Again, you probably can't do this if you're watching on your iPhone, but you could scan and get one of the books Melanie and I put together on how we, um, we envision what we're doing for our investors. A little bit of backstory on us is I started real estate investing in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, I had a great time living there as a student actually worked worked there for a while and uh, enjoyed it. And that was how we learned how to house hack back in the 90s. Uh, after living in Europe, I got to come back and meet a family office called a Christovest and build beautiful projects with them. That's me as a really young dude on TV talking about our projects that we had just finished. And then to the right is uh, a company I helped that same family office build called Icona and exited there in 2018. And it's been a case study of people. I, I, I was at Left Field Investors and someone said to me, so you're working hard and you're doing a good job. Great. Now tell me where you failed. And I say, well, we fail every day, <laughs> you know, because we're not shooting darts at the wall and we're not just buying single family homes that if we fail, it's 50 grand we lost and we can walk on. I will tell you, and maybe Scott can tell you backstories. I'm sure we've gotten kicked in the gut more times than most developers, uh, but we we choose not to stay down. It's the Rocky story. I think each of these six case studies was a big failure at one point in some ways, like my very first one in 2012 where we did our first hotel turnaround. There was a time after 12 months where the investment looked like we'd made a big mistake, and just a few months later it was worth uh, $37 million from $8 million. But at first it did not look right. And we were definitely, you could have stopped there and called it a failure. Uh, Rocky definitely failed many times in his battles, but he got, he got, could take the punches. And I think that's the story with us in our industry. We don't plan on having a catastrophic failure. We do a lot of, um, design in our capital. Um, we did do a lot of different designs to make sure that we don't ever collapse. And so because of that, we've been able to withstand things like the COVID at this project at Renault, we came, came to fruition right at the COVID, uh, the launch of that beautiful thing. So, um, and then of course we bought Kent because the COVID helped us knock the price down. 
a million dollars. We bought that and then we did that one. And then left left field investors, a lot of us uh, bought in on uh, our most recent project. And boy, is that doing well. Those tough experiences plus the good experiences helped us create three companies. And one is how do you run big resorts? What is the business turnaround team? And that's called Viva May Hospitality. But who owns the buildings? That's accountable equity. When we want to own the buildings, we also put cash into the building. For Melanie and I, Scott puts money into the buildings through accountable equity. We buy into our own projects. And then because all of our projects always have a value add real estate component, we do have an in-house construction team. We even have some operators of each skill and trade. But our real gift to the partners is that we economize the construction management and speed to delivery of product. Now, this is too complex of a slide to read. But if you'll let me have 10, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, Melanie and I, you can see we're in our masks. This picture's old. But when we um, decided to go all in on investing in real estate, that is hospitality, we knew that hospitality assets are a combination of physical value add and the soul of good old fashioned hospitality. And we call that that spirit, Viva May, revive the soul. That's kind of our purpose. Our name is our purpose, revive the soul. And for us, we think we can revive the souls of our team. Our team can revive the souls of the guests. And another one of our teams can revive the building's story or quote unquote soul. So we're trying to revive souls in that concept. We want the guests to walk on property, to know they're welcomed home, uh, to feel connected, and to find peace, truth, beauty, and goodness are some of the elements we put into all our design. But in order to live that, we strive for three crazy virtues. And we try to teach this to our team. This is Melanie and I teaching it to our team years ago. We do this every single week. Uh, Melanie and I are not at every event. We do more of them a week than obviously we could ever be at. So our leaders run these. And this is where we ask our staff to join us on a mission to have three virtues that we're striving for. And this is what the magic sauce really is, is that we're, we're, we're really doing it. There's not too much magic. It's really grinding it out where when you're hiring someone, you share the three virtues with them. And then you actually try to live these virtues of joy of service, humility of heart, and ministry as a purpose. And I defined those here. I believe they're okay defined here. But ministry means that we have an intention to show love to our guests, not just feed them meat or de deliver a beer or deliver a glass of wine. That's the function now, functional task we're doing, but there's an intentionality behind it. The humility means we love, we accept you and love you where you, where you are. We, we It's the same dignity every person has. So Humility allows us to um, not only create a great team atmosphere, esprit de corps, but it allows us to stay out of any kind of political movements or activism because we already love everyone. And then joy is the idea that we're trying to find people that actually do this, whatever the work is, resonates with their, their joy. And then we want to foster joy in, in the daily life. When all that comes to fruition, we at the end of the day feel accountable to the equity entrusted to us and, and our own ex equity. You know, we have talents and human talents we've been given. And this idea of accountable equity is super holistic in my mind. And so this is a kind of a diagram of the flywheel of how it's working. And I'm sure we can make this better over the years. But at the top here is we've in aggregated a very good size community of investors. Scott's going to go through the statistics in a minute. And we want to basically what we're doing is we're saying to investors, join us so you can build legacy assets um, with us. I know you probably have other portfolio, but what we want you to feel when you join us is something of legacy and substance and status, stature. Um, we're going to go out and buy real assets. That's step two. We're going to use your capital to buy real assets. Then uh, one of the things we talk a lot about is expert teams. We're going to constantly grow through talent acquisition. And we think great teams make great businesses. Great businesses make value-add real estate extremely profitable. And it makes it stand the test of time. We can talk about all these things for hours, so we won't. And then ultimately, there's a shared prosperity back to the investors. And it is inherent in our program that it's shared with the entire 
constituents, which includes the staff. So they, they, the compensation packages here are reasonable to above reasonable. They're very good so that we can take great care of your assets and have a legacy asset. Scott. Thank you, Josh. So my wife and I are invested in over 20 different passive investments. And when I think of that, we're partners in each and every one of those. But more importantly, we're really partnering with the sponsor, the syndicator, the team that's behind each of those different journeys that we're going through with them. So what I'm most proud of here with Accountable Equity is the investor community that we have built here. Um, not only are we obviously a strong group of operators, but the community that's behind us, trust in what we're doing because of the results, because of what uh, we have done for our investors and our community. So with that, our, our community continues to grow. It's very strong. Uh, I'm, I know, Josh, you're, you're especially happy uh, and thankful for every single one of, of the investors that joins our community, whether they're actively involved in actually investing or just becoming a part of it. So we're up to 42, over 4,200 investors, um, which is only, what, four, almost five years now uh, in, in the growth. And it's exponentially growing much quicker than it did in the past. We're at 371 active investors across the nine successful funds, and the 10th one uh, launched just this week, which is EIF5. And then we are community-based um, investors on private investing and education. So we all enjoy teaching and sharing that information with our peers. Uh, we do look at those private SEC exempt private offerings uh, and also based on proven industry leaders uh, who really know their space as well. So clearly that's what we're looking for. So I'm not going to go through this slide with each of our different funds, but uh, certainly you can see that we have a lot of funds. We've been operating these funds strategically uh, to, to perfection as best as it can. But of course, there are lessons that are learned from each and every one of them. But what I would highlight here is EIF 5 is being launched on Friday at noon, as Chad had said earlier, to the LFI community. So we have to, you to scan that and join us on that event on Friday. And we look forward to going over that fund with you. And I'll, Any I'll, I'll point out two things support. before you go, Scott, because I want to. I know you want to go to the next slide. The yellow represents the other assets that you could join us on today, right? You can finish correct. up our LBI project for just a little bit of money left there. Um, and then yeah, that has seventy thousand remaining. And collateralized debt fund is is a green fund, uh, a greenfield fund that's always open. Um, so definitely take a look at both of those. Reach out to us if, if you have any questions on them. Now, we were going to talk about multifamily, Scott, and I asked you to just share a little bit of backstory. So we're walk. I think this meeting was to just say, Josh and Scott, what are you? what's Accountable Equity doing? And I know Scott talks to more investors than I do, and I appreciate how much he does talk to everyone, and I'm sure he's talked to some of you. He says most of the conversations start with multifamily as a backdrop to why they're adding us to their portfolio. So we're, we're taking a little step back here and talking about the greater opportunities in, in the market and what may or may not be opportunities. Scott, could you share a little bit about what you're seeing in the multifamily? Definitely. So personally, I, I'm involved in uh, six different multifamilies currently. About two years ago, I started seeing the writing on the wall, interest rates probably going to be going up. The, just the cost of uh, the acquisitions were, I thought, higher already. And in what was gleaming in, in 24 months, 18 to 24 months, I just saw that it wasn't necessarily the right time. And then you fast forward, here we are. Uh, and this is what we're finding, right? Is that uh, every single one of my uh, multifamily deals, and I'm sure everybody that's on here uh, feels the same, is that distributions were paused, right? Somewhere they need to start reserving capital and building it up for the additional cost to debt services, right? That everyone's feeling. Um, so, you know, for that reason, um, you know, I think multifamily has been put on pause by, by mo most families um, who are looking to invest and, and they are looking for something different uh, currently. Um, and, you know, as, as you look at the existing deals that are out there, meaning the ones you're already investing in, it's, it's that uncertainty of what's, what's going to happen with those interest rates, right? What's going to happen with the refinancing that was supposed to happen? Is that going to delay the, the exit of the, of the investment? Is it going to change the performa? What kind of uh, capital improvements were already completed versus now what's going to happen in the future? Are they going to ever get done? Are they going to get paused? And I've seen that majority of them have been getting slowed down at least, if not paused. And then, um, you know, it's not the optimal time really to be to be selling. 
So that means that you're going to be holding on to those a little bit longer. Um, and then there is a refi market, so that's great, but the interest rates are, are still higher. So um, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to do that. When it comes to new deals, um, those purchase prices are still still certainly higher. Um, and then the deal structures are just ex are excessively longer. Um, so, you know, if you want to type your money for eight to 10 years, great. You know, the, the deals are out there. Uh, but no matter what, that interest rate still is the uncertainty to the market. Um, but there is still a loan market. So that's that's great. Yeah, by the way, we um, we really looked at doing hospitality to housing and we've been judicious about that. Scott and I made a, a personal investment to to test the market. And um, there will be distress that will allow that opportunity to grow in the future. But for right now, we're, we're um, staying focused on the opposite, which is hospitality turnaround. So in our specialty, which is a specialty within a specialty, we, we, we do live within the world of hospitality. And that sounds like, oh, okay, hospitality is transient guests. Um, for those who know us, they know we're one of the largest operators, if not the largest operators of premium weddings in the country and because of that we're hospitality with this massive contract revenue which de-risks all of us even me because obviously i'm the one signing for the big debt so we want that good contract revenue pays the debt and then us investors benefit from the growing um, of the entire business but debt markets are not as good in the hospitality business and and so whereas scott made a good point that there is a loan market for multifamily. It's just not very good. It's like 50% equity, high interest rate. So it makes a deal in, almost impossible to cash flow, but you can get good debt if, I mean, that's considered good debt. The hospitality market is also there. It's just there at a much smaller ratio of banks. Um, usually regional banks are helping us better than national banks, but there is, um, there is opportunity. See, that's the thing we see. You know, just like every business, a, a lot of podcasts, like I mentioned, are doing the we should buy businesses right now. Operators are tired. It only only accentuates that when you own a massive piece of real estate and you have a business and real estate both deteriorating because you're fa you're failing or you're tired. So we see this as like this is our season, right? I mean, this is our season. We, we this is our time. You know, deals are priced right now. And operators are willing to to find win wins for us, um, and we have this kind of unique selling proposition to a to a seller. You know, one we're battle tested. You know, I've been through three cycles through this now, or two cycles really, uh, plus one if you want to say at the end of the boom that was when I was building houses. But we listen to what the seller wants. You know, just like uh, Chris Voss says in never in to never split the difference. That guy we got to talk to last week. He really talks about listening. What does the seller want? How can you get there? And if not, then it's not a deal. If you can, there's a deal. Um, and we have a wonderful community. And many of you are part of our community. And that's a big honor. Because we're part of the accountable equity community, it really does reassure the seller that it's not just one person trying to come in and steal their property from them or one person that says they can do something. but doesn't have the team and we consider this a big big selling proposition <clears throat> as a matter of fact uh, I'm just... Josh, what i was going to say is every Go seller that we're talking to they put their hard energy time sweat tears into it so you know what they are looking at is the operator and making sure that, that they're selecting someone who's going to really take care of what they've done uh, and and that's where we went on that story time and time again and yeah look, this is a tease because scott's like don't you don't have to share this tonight um, but this will be coming soon. This is one of those extremely opportunistic win-win, but valuable acquisitions we're, we're going through the process on right now. And, you know, it's, it's our classic 1.5 1, 1. miles of waterfront, heavy trafficked waterfront, um, vineyard, restaurant, vineyard, wedding venue, manor house, something really special. Uh, so this will be coming soon. But it was a, a wonderful story of a family that poured their heart into a building. Um, and that there are more buildings than are shown here, but has recently had a terrible diagnosis. And so they 
This is the furthest, furthest thing from their mind. Now, thank God they've been, um, they're well, you know, secured with capital themselves. So they're not, they're not distressed. They always tell you that every investor, every seller says that I'm not distressed. They're not. So we, we won this deal through a, a, a very patient negotiation uh, where we found something beautiful for them and, and very good for us investors. More to come on that, but that's kind of how this is going in this market. We think it's the beginning of a lot of that opportunity. So we've been patient for a reason. Scott and I have been patient and not really jumping after every deal. We do look at a lot of deals because we want to understand what's a good, what's a bad. Please, um, you know, I don't want to waste all your time. This is the secret sauce of our next few steps in this life as accountable equity. We're staying focused on the horizon. Uh, there was a speech we gave last year called Legacy Asset Investing and, and our perspective on investing, which started almost a year ago as a, as a speech and as a talk. It feels like now, I think a lot of people are saying these types of comments, so I'll explain what that meant. Acquiring our focus is on basis, cost to acquisition, and if there's value to be created. And those are the only two, that's the two criteria we take into account. Um, our model is a business acquisition strategy with a real estate value add. And because of that, we tend to have the ability to outperform and outsustain market volatility. Our market focus will stay, we will aggregate properties that are accretive to our local footprint. So we have a footprint in Maryland. We're doing well, very well on the water. We will continue to look for properties in that region. We are very successful in New Jersey, um, and we will continue to attract properties that are offered to us that serve the same client. Um, and then we'll grow in key markets. There's something very special coming soon about, uh, uh, we'll, well, we'll talk about it soon. It's in Northern Florida and St. Augustine. It's uh, coming soon, so more information later. And, and, and here's the fifth point that I think is great, is uh, we're finally about to open up our funds that already are successful, already have produced great yield for investors because it's time to propel growth. So there will be a time very soon where you could actually join us at Renault, and I'll show you why in a moment. By the way, this is a tease. This was a speech that took a lot of slides but this is our perspective on the types of investors that find a home with us that get great yield, but also great satisfaction in, in, in kind of like secure portion of their portfolio. And it's where you, be, where you really see our assets as your legacy assets. Investors are co-founders with us. Ownership becomes more of a stewardship because we're not going to let these become slums like some hotel, uh, some apartments might become. We're not, we're not going to starve them of uh, ongoing maintenance because we're not here to flip them. We're here to improve them. Uh, value add is more about reviving and finding new imagination, reimagine. And then an exit strategy becomes generational wealth building. There actually are several exit strategies for us. Um, we can go into those in some other time, but our typical strategy though is the core asset is, is a forever hold. There's things like at Renault where we're able to maybe parcel off some sections of new areas for 55 plus community that would be accretive to our um, our community, to our restaurants and everything. But that would actually just be a bifurcation of a part of our main core asset, whereas we could still have our cake and eat it too. So there's things like that that are in the pipeline with developers, um, but not finished. So we're, we're, we're very creative. We're not trying to get rid of these beautiful things we've built. Um, we're trying to make sure you guys and us get to have them for a long, long time. And this is another, you know, little thing we put together. Just th this is the inner sanctum of our brains, right? Scott and I and the team, everyone, Melanie, all of us, is we're, we look at this is how we want to build generational wealth, the steps of legacy investment, you know, deal pr prospecting, construction management that makes it good for a long time, not just good to look pretty with lipstick, business plans that are methodically designed, values move with the market, you know, but volatility is mitigated by a longer horizon. That number four should be in bold. Um, values, we know all values will increase for cash flowing good real estate because inflation will force value increase. But there is always going to be the moments of volatility. 
and we're in one of those volatilities. So we know from a horizon perspective, we're on the right track. Um, but we also know there's dips. So how can we get over the dips and into the horizon? Now, capitalization is a big thing for us. We want to increase our ratio of capitalization. Um, we've always been pretty careful with that. But I think we, um, the better, the higher that capitalization, the better your security is in the asset. Tax efficiency, we've never, we've never done any deal without talking about the tax efficiency first and teamwork. Um, this is what we currently are running around doing. You know, we're building one of the best wineries in America, Ken Island's becoming a poster child for uh, the wealthy, wealthy um, DC market wedding and getaways. We ha we're doing so many corporate now. Now I say that because I'm very grateful. This entire week is multiple corporations coming into v uh, Kent. Uh, we're same thing with Renault. We have corporate here, corporations here, but it's like the tip of the iceberg. We like, I don't know if we're even at 10% of capacity of what we could do for corporate, but boy, it's growing and it's really big brand names. You know, it's, it's the big pharmas that, you know, it's the great companies, you know, and they're bringing their executives. So I always find that compelling. What happens when an executive falls in love with their getaway place? Does this become their child's wedding venue? Who knows? And then LBI is just a great success story too, uh, even though it's only really in full year one. And you know, this is that whole value out of real estate concept we're talking about. We, re we definitely make the real estate great. And then thank God we get rewarded as an operating company where our growth is substantial. You know, uh, you see where we're tracking to finish this year with a strong EBITDA production, which allows us to uh, make distributions on pace. But, um, you know, the thing Scott and I talk about is, you know, 24 million annual projected this year. That's uh, twice what we thought it would be in 10 years. We thought it'd be a 12 to $13 million a year business. So, you know, we're, we're outperforming our original strategy. I do want to let you watch this if you can hear it. Tell me if you can hear this. Can you hear it, Scott? No? Yeah, it's coming through. It is coming through? It was there. Oh, it's really quiet, though. If you can, I don't know if it's got a volume option. Okay, so what I'll do is, I don't know why it's not playing through there, but I can put this up to the speaker. Oh, okay. What this is, it's hilarious. This is just a real candid video. For those of you who can hear me. It's, a, oh, I turned the mic, so now you can hear me. <laughs> This video happened in real time. This family came over. They were talking to one of our staff and our staff said, Josh, you got to meet this family um, at our cafe. I said, oh yeah, absolutely. They're, they're like, they're not having their wedding here and they're heartbroken about it. I said, oh my gosh, what did we do wrong? <laughs> you know, what did we do wrong? And this was their answer. Okay. Now tell me to okay. Here's a question for you, two questions. Don't you wish we had more rooms? How many rooms would you have liked? But how many would you think your couples would have needed? Your, uh, your family? Yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. And you, of course. Did you have two two nights? Did you want? How many? Yes. Two nights. Okay. Like a regular at least two. Okay. Now, eight thought more. Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. It's a wedding, it's like a destination. It doesn't be on the spot or anything else. So, yeah. We're also putting the Okinawa with his family. They've guests from London, Paris. So it has to come to like one spot. And that's why this you guys had both so much. Right, Thank you so much for you know checking us out. Yeah. Now I have a second follow up question. If when you visited a few months ago or weeks ago, if we would have said we will solve all of your room, we would have we will do it with our partner hotels and our hotel. Would that have helped you make a decision yes. here? Yes. If we would have done it as a suit. Well, this it's a pleasure to get to know you guys. Thank you for saying hello. All right. All right. I don't know if you guys could hear it. Scott, was it like okay to hear? It was okay. It was in and out. So for the you could get the, the gist of it. 
Yeah. So that's that kind of explains why we have a tremendous opportunity. That family ended up having to book at a hotel that had 200 rooms. Now, we don't necessarily think we can get to 200 rooms right away, but we we probably could have been more aggressive and gotten them. Um, one, you probably heard I was talking about an operational improvement. As you can see, I'm always focused on that. We could have probably done a booking for them, but that is tricky too, by the way. But as far as rooms, we need rooms. So that's why we're going to be opening up for no. Now, hopefully you take a minute and register for Learn and Grow. And I am and Scott are available to all questions. Um, please open up the floor, my friend, Chad. Yes, thank you for that. Always interesting to hear what's the latest and greatest with your group. So I'll call out, um, put it in the chat, but I'll call it out now too. If anybody has any questions for Josh and Scott, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, we happen to get those covered with them, but um, we'll open it up to the floor if there's any questions that are out there. Um, Steve's been a big part of being involved with all of this that's going on. He's had nothing but positive feedback. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking. I don't have a question at hand, but Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot and see <laughs> if you've no, got I, one I, to get going. I do. I have a question. I think uh, maybe some some of the investors <laughs> out there would about, want to hear is, uh, I know there's a hotel fund out there somewhere in our forum. They're discussing this. So what would you say is your advantage of investing in one of your resorts versus say a hotel fund where there, these hotels are maybe at an inter intersection of major highways and that kind of thing. What, what do you think is the advantage of what you guys are doing? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll start. And then Scott can say, I always said clearly the people who bought many of those holiday and expresses over the years have done great for themselves. And I have nothing, but I'm sure they do well. I'm sure they do well. I, I remember remember thinking, uh, now you pay a lot of money for the a good performing one. So if you if this fund you're describing is going after tired ones that needs a big capital improvement, you know, that in the model of a Holiday Inn Express or whatever the, the select service, I think it's every seven years, if not five years, you have to rip them apart and put them back together, which is good because they get worn and torn. Um, what I've always said about highway hotels, I use them. I'm not against them. People stay there. Somebody makes money. What I always say is you are busy because of natural demand. So if you're in a high demand area, you're probably going to overpay for buying that building. If you're in a low demand area, you're probably going to get the right price. But I always say we make our demand. Now, I've always felt like that gives us a strategic advantage. So when we book weddings, we create the surplus demand that then allows ADR rate. So two things happen with our model. One, one that nobody can even grasp. When I talk to major financiers, they, they I always say, why don't we get more credit from bankers for this? Because we're sitting on a piece of their money before they even have the event, a good piece of their money. And they're locked into coming. So it's not like a rainy day at the beach where people cancel their reservations and everybody gets really hurt. It's just you're coming. Regrettably, you're coming if it's a nor'easter. As long as it's not a hurricane, you're having your wedding. So we get locked in revenue, which I find to be a strategic advantage, and we charge almost double for the rooms than with select service in our market. To me, that's a positive because you and I own the property and we've worked very hard to fill the hotel. Obviously, as a consumer, we're, we're more expensive but we turn away more rooms four to 10 more you heard her. She said she would have liked 100 rooms for two days. Our entire hotel is 55 rooms. So we have the opposite problem where we could, we could fill a 200 plus room hotel, which allows us to hold our rate pretty high, get our occupancy booked a long time in advance. And so we have a lot of consistency. So in a, in a typical hotel, they just, they just, they truly don't know from week to week. They have projections and hopefully the market holds. They're doing something they call revenue management all the time. For us, we do revenue management really like on a, a, a one year horizon because we're, we're already sold out for most weekends for next year. So I, those are things you just can't get in a normal hotel. As a matter of fact, it baffles most hoteliers when I talk to them. And I think that's why we have a major runway to grow. The thing Scott talks about is that's not the end of the revenue, right, Scott? Oh, it's the revenue streams, the multiple levers that we can pull. So, um, you know, when you do look at um, 
your hotels on the major roads, they're they're typically driven by business, right? And business travelers. And not that COVID was on the anything that I was thinking of when I was looking at Renault at the at the first time, but knowing that there was weddings that were driving and there were contracts, and then they were coming the night before, they were having that um rehearsal dinner. They were they were then gonna probably play golf, the men. The women were were gonna just get ready. Um, right. And then there was going to be an after party at night and maybe in a private room or in the winery. So there was just money coming onto that property in so many different places where money is exchanged. That was super impressive to me. And then you look now um, with just what has been born of all the different events that they do on the outside uh, from Bittner Wonderland to the spring events, the fall events. Um, I mean, this is just the general public coming out and spending money, not even talking the winery. Right. So that that's the impressive part of what we do um, across the properties. Yeah. And just the consistency of it, Steve, you know, um, even the growth to this day still growing, you know, even way after most wedding businesses slowed down. And that's just a that's a factor that we take it so seriously. And the, and I think the value is there for the bride. But I do not. Poo -poo. I remember one time I was at a conference, Steve, and a guy said to me, uh, I own all the. Um, motel sixes or something like that and, I'm, and he's like i don't get to be cool like uh you know like these people that own ritz carlton's now ritz carlton's ironically that's the two ends of the spectrum like like motel six and ritz carlton ritz, ritz carlton's are usually very low profitability and motel sixes are better profitability and we're in the middle of like there's a bigger market for us from from either of those two extremes and we're more profitable than both of them uh, we're in the 20 plus percentile profit. So as you get to that level of profitability, it's very, like a Ritz Carlton is happy at 5% profitability. Motel 6, you know, the way they get their profitability is by not having any cleanliness or service. So we're not going to go down that path. We're going to stay right in the middle where we can over deliver on service and, and, and get paid for it for our investors. Okay. And uh, one question about, due diligence from your standpoint, and I guess ultimately LP standpoint, I noticed that you rejected multiple resorts uh, over the past year, or I don't know if it's two years or whatnot, but is there a common theme in terms of why you rejected uh, or didn't Thanks. want to buy those resorts? Yeah, I mean, we have a matrix that we use. It's not the same for other people, but ours is, um, we, we do think there's something primordial about what we're trying to do. You know, natural beauty, uh, something authentic has to be in the building or some other compelling reason. So we're looking for this compelling market proof that we can do a business turnaround. Some of those had marginal authenticity that we could use. Some of them were historic properties. Some two of them were like really interesting, but their natural beauty in the surrounding was bad. Like, like one was on a road, one was next to a, 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 a police station. I was like, man, I don't know, man. So there was something broken. So then we said, well, what if we then pushed the uh, current business model down? So instead of trying to get the solid middle to premium middle class wedding, we'll do the, you know, over the top wedding, but for at a budget. As we look at all our variables, we start to play. We create large models. Usually our models have dozens and dozens of pages because we're also set testing the market. Our model does a few things, right? We're, we're bringing in locals for uh for lift we don't bank on that money but it's it needs to be there as the juice for future we're bringing the weddings in as the first anchor we're then selling the rooms as the premium price and then we have a beneficiary restaurant like our restaurants will do several million dollars a year just because of the pre-game wedding business and the post-game wedding business so it's almost like those are guaranteed pieces of the revenue but we do do millions of dollars for locals too so when the pieces don't all line up we then either go back and offer a, a more discounted basis acquisition. And if that doesn't work out, then we walk away. But in the middle there, those deals, uh, the other thing is, is we buy typically not performing well properties. So that's why we, we do all those tests. I use analytics from uh, the knot to find out if we make the best looking venue, how many leads will we get? So that's really where the basis starts. And then the rest has to be accretive. We also love to have the third spoke and we don't talk about this much, Scott, but you know, first it's going to be, is there a business turnaround story that we can believe in? Two, is there a value add real estate story we can believe in? And third, we don't promise it, but we are always looking for third land development, either 
uh, recapitalization through uh, sale of that land development rights or build it out to be accretive to the resort. We don't put it in the pro forma, but we want to have that third. It's kind of a soft exit strategy, Steve. Again, these are things that you can't do at a side of the road hotel because they're built on like one one point one acres or half an acre. They are what they are. Whereas we we try to bake in some upsides um, that we don't even put in the model, but we want them because I'm a, we're naturally a land developer. So we don't want to try to do them this week. This is why we need a horizon. But we want to give that to you guys because that's the thing Scott talks about a lot with us. We're perpetual hold strategists. For, and we, we have protect, perpetual participation at this point for all our investors. Kind of in that vein, you're, you spoke to due diligence around your own criteria for purchasing. We're a community of limited partner investors, always kind of considering different options. But I think most people are very comfortable with doing due diligence and in, in underwriting on a multifamily home. Can you explain oh, what a limited partner Scott, ought to be looking help. at when they review your deals? Yeah, what's their great, great question? Yeah, what I would say the, the first thing that that uh, I think aha moment that a lot of folks that I talk to uh, that they realize is when you're looking at a multifamily, what you're looking at is a is a contracted lease, right? That's one year. We we're looking at a room that is rented on a daily basis. And that dynamic pricing we're able to do, that, that's what hotels do is dynamic pricing based on demand. So we're able to discount when there's a weekend that there's nothing going on. And when we know there's four weddings going on, that rate's gonna go much higher. Um, so it really allows us to be dynamic in what we're doing. Um, where, you know, when, when you're looking at that multifamily, it, it's gonna be based on what the what the market demand is. Um, and, and as Josh said, we're, we're booked two years out especially on the prime weekends. Um, so we know what's going on two years in advance. And I would say from a, uh, from a due diligence on us, what I encourage people to do is one, not to rush into investing. If this is so hard for you to understand, I get it as, a, as an investor. As a matter of fact, one, we take limited passive investors and what we say is the best way to underwrite it is to get to know our projects and us. But if I were them, I would probably focus on what is the financial return strategy? First of all, do I even want it that way? That's what I tell them to look at. You got two things to look at. You got the business plan and the team that's going to execute it. Please underwrite that the best you can. And two, underwrite the model of how we're going to repay you. And if you don't believe in that, then don't even worry about doing the business plan review. But when you go to the business plan review, um, like for example, here's how we're starting to do. We know inflation has happened. So over here on the returns to investor strategy, we know that we can't liquidate, we can't exhaust all our capital through annual prefs, preference payments, because that would damage our operating business. However, we also know investors want an annual distribution. So when, our, when we're doing our analysis, we're saying, well, if someone wants a 12% all the way up to a 12% pref, the way we can model that is we can't pay it all up front, but we can put a threshold that we can get you to about six or half each year, carry the other half, and then nothing else happens, no other distributions, no other waterfall until you get caught back up and then you get your recap. So one, get to know our model first, the, the financial returns model to you. That's the first thing I would investigate. And then two, investigate the team and the business plan. When you go to underwrite it, no, it's not like multifamily. You're not gonna be able to pull a comp set on occupancy in the area is, 93% and we're running at 70. So you see the gap and you can easily close it for us. Um, we'll probably show you in it, what we think the main driver is, which is weddings. And you'll have to say, okay, I see there where they got those numbers. It's kind of like your occupancy on, on rooms in a sense, but we actually find that the happiest investors with us are the ones that either conceptually grasp the business model and, and understand why this model has long leg length, Link, you know, a long runway of, of wedding business and therefore the contingent and that we're in two businesses. We're in a lot of businesses, but it's wedding business and it's lifestyle drive to resort, both of which blew right through the COVID with resiliency. All the hospitality that was not drive to lifestyle really struggled. As a matter of fact, inner city Philadelphia is still at 50% or less occupancy 
when it used to be in the 70s. So it's never yet recovered the hospitality industry of Philly because their city and they're, you know what I mean? They're not drive to, not natural, not lifestyle. So you're underwriting your assumption of lifestyle drive to. And then what we always say, study the market we're in. We believe in a few paradigms. Drive to from Manhattan will always be wealthy. Drive to from Philly, secondarily wealthy. Drive to from DC, we think is the most solid forever. I always say, if you believe America is going to be here for a while, then DC is going to get richer. Okay. So we serve the rich of DC and we're not even talking about the rich. We're talking about every middle-class person can have a wedding at our property. And there's a ton of middle-class consultants, lobbyists, tech, tech investors. It's a big tech area. So we, that's why Kent continues to grow beyond our projections. And it's been, those are the things to underwrite. No. I went a lot into that. No, uh, it's the markets low. we're in. Do you think those markets will be wealthy? No, these we're not a housing play. So the good news is we get a pass on housing. What do you call that? The communist regime coming into housing and price locks. What do you call those things? Like rate. We're not, we don't have to worry about that because we're not dealing with a um, regulated government industry of housing. So you can invest where the money is, which is New York City market. You can invest where DC is because that's where a ton of wedding business is. Um, but you don't have to worry about us like having rent controls or something like rent that. Controls, right. So you get the benefit of the wealth without the risk of the, the uh, bad policies. You get my point? Yeah. And then whereas in multifamily, I probably would only ever invest in multifamily in the South. Right. That me personally, because I know the, the rent programs are better. The affordability is a little better. Either, the other thing I was going to say is that, that, that's that these are operating businesses. Anyone can just walk up and walk into the hotel lobby and, and actually that's see it in operation. Whether you're a, a prospective point. investor or a guest, our, our, our leadership, our, our employees, our staff do not know that. You're going to be treated as if, as if anybody else off the street, uh, which when I first, you know, was, was meeting Josh, um, I wasn't able to do that. But many investors now go down and go to one of our resorts, if not multiple of them, and take a walk through and see what it's like. Uh, if there's nothing else that closes someone's mind on, is this the right opportunity for them? It's it's just going there unannounced and seeing what, what the business is like. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's fair. Yeah. Let, let me ask you this. As um, a, a wedding event-driven business, what's your Monday through Wednesday strategy? Well, I was alluding to that. <laughs> what, do, as, what do you do with those, those days, those throwaway days, if you will? <laughs> yeah, they are. And they're not usually in our original models. When we go to market with a business plan, we always show those really modest and they, they take a long time to mature. Our long-term strategy is that we want to wow everybody who comes to a wedding. They also own businesses and we'll sell corporate business meetings, but we're very careful not to overpromise that because it takes time. For some reason, the wedding business is the opposite. This is an inbound business. At Renault, we'll have 5,000 uh, women ask for a packet at, this year at Renault. That, not all of them are serious, but that's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Corporate is almost always an outbound phone call, almost always. Hmm. So that's why we don't say yet we can turn that baby right on. Whereas the inbound, if we do the right marketing and the right aesthetic of the room, we get the phone calls. And that, that's, actually, that's not just us. That would be if you guys wanted to do a really great wedding venue and you followed this recipe, it would work for you too. We just are taking it seriously. The sure. corporate growing, hundreds and hundreds of corporate events this year across the platform, but it could be like, like, like 10 times that. Meaning... Yeah. If you think of how many days I have, how many rooms I have, I mean, meeting rooms, so because of these weddings, we have uh, Renault. I always argue we have 24 private rooms you could rent. You're not going to rent them all at the same time, but that's how many we have. And so you can get my point. That's why we get really more the executive retreats because we don't have yeah. enough rooms. Yeah. So we aren't moving the LFI meet up there anytime soon. So I'm told. excited for you to do that, actually. <laughs> I've been pitching that to Jim that we could do the East there Coast LFI. There we go. I like it. Sounds good. Uh, we did have a question pop up in the Q&A as well. Uh, for Bob, as an LP with Accountable Equity, my very first syndication was a note fund that provided a modest return with relative low risk. 
this gave me a good opportunity to better understand my, the business and get to know the team very well. It was very comforting to meet the other investors. I guess it's not a question. It's all nice to go with you guys, which is good. And they seem uh, in the team that operate. Uh, this gave us a brand new investor and an easy entry into syndications and specifically the hospitality space. I, and I, I'm not shocked by that comment because this is who you guys are. Uh, you guys are great to work with. You have a wonderful product. I still need to make my first trip out to one of the venues and I look forward to that. They said. But uh, it, you know, not shocking. Thank you, Bob, though, for the comments. That's nice. So well, I, we appreciate you guys. Thanks for yeah, having us. And we're absolutely. here at any time. We're going to do uh, the efficient income fund on Friday. That'll, that'll, that's a crowd pleaser for LFI. I was surprised how many people came up to me. They love that. A part. lot of fans of those. So yeah, I'll be curious how Friday goes. But no, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on and, and sharing information. So thank you for that. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, Very Josh good. And Scott. Great. We'll see you on Friday then. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.